Welcome and good afternoon. I'm Kim Rubin, Saul Price Fellow of the Tax Policy Center and Director of the State and Local Finance Initiative at the Urban Institute. It is my great pleasure to welcome you here today to be part of a conversation about the changing economic and fiscal conditions facing our states. This is part of an annual series of conversations we host examining the fiscal health and challenging challenges facing different levels of state and local governments. It's been quite a volatile few years with states facing uncertainty and challenges related to the COVID-19 pandemic and surrounding economic conditions. And while most states started this fiscal year earlier this month with healthy balance sheets and in far better shapes than we could have ever imagined two years ago, there is a question of whether the economy is slowing and if we need to prepare now for new challenges. Are we on the brink of another recession? And if so, are states in a good position to handle it? We have an excellent panel to, to address these questions today and help us understand both where the economy might be going and what it means for state spending and revenues. But first, some quick housekeeping. This virtual event is being recorded and will be posted online afterward. There are bios for our panelists on the events page. All participants are muted, but please type your questions and comments into the Q&A box at any time. We will be reviewing this throughout the broadcast and are leaving time at the end for the panelists to respond. While captions are on, you can hide them or adjust settings with the live transcript button. We encourage everyone in the audience to continue today's dialogue by sharing your thoughts or observations on social media using the hashtag live at urban. And we would appreciate it if you could take a few minutes and complete the post-event survey at the end of the event. Our panel will be moderated by Liz Farmer, a fiscal policy expert and journalist who has, helps make complicated public finance issues more understandable. Liz will introduce the other panelists. Thanks again for joining us. Take it away, Liz. Hi, everyone. Welcome again to the discussion. And I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, first, we have Lucy Dadian, the Senior Research Associate at the Urban's Brookings Tax Policy Center. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Shelby Kearns, Executive Director of the National Association of State Budget Officers. And Mark Zandi, Chief Economist at Moody's Analytics. And if you could all um, turn on your cameras and we will get this show on the road. We're gonna leave about 15 minutes at the end for a Q&A for the audience. So um, please feel free to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to enter in any questions you have. Um, Mark, I'm gonna start with you first, uh, just to give us a broad overview here of the state of the economy. I know the advanced GDP, um, Sorry, the advanced GDP estimate is going to be out later this week. What's your expectation? Well, thank you, Liz, Lucy, Kim, and Urban for the opportunity to participate today. It's a, really a, a pleasure to be able to be with this group. So thank you. Uh, uh, my expect, Liz, my expectation for second quarter GDP, was that the question? Yeah, and broad oh. overview of the economy. And know? broad overview. So <laughs> kind of an open-ended question. I can go anywhere I exactly. want. Exactly. Okay, very good. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, I'd say the economy is struggling. Uh, growth is slowing, and you're going to see that in the second quarter GDP number. That will uh, likely be a, a negative number, a decline. Uh, right now, we're estimating it to be down about 1% annualized. That comes on the heels of a decline in the first quarter. Uh, that was one, down 1.6%. 1 uh, and so two quarters of consecutive GDP declines. Historically, that's been a pretty good rule of thumb for pegging recessions. Uh, but I don't think we're in a recession. The economy is struggling, growth is slowing, but we're not in recession. A recession is a broad, it, you know, here in the US, it's defined by, recessions are defined by the uh, Business Cycle Dating Committee, a group of academic economists at the National Bureau of Economic Research. And they they define a recession. I'm going to paraphrase, so I don't have the words exactly right, but you'll get the point. A broad-based persistent decline in economic activity. Uh, I don't think uh, that the first half of this year qualifies uh, for recession. And you know, there are lots of different ways of demonstrating that, but most obviously, most significantly is jobs. We, we created a lot of jobs in the first half of this year, uh, an average of four or 500,000 per month, which is a lot of jobs. You know, typically this economy for stable unemployment would create about 100,000 jobs per month. Uh, layoffs were, 
if they weren't at record lows, they were pretty darn close. I mean, if you look at unemployment insurance claims, they were you know rock bottom. Uh, consumer spending, or in- incomes, all the things that this, this group would look at to try to discern whether we were in a recession, they'd say, no, this is not a recession. The other thing I would say, and no one's going to be able to prove me wrong or right for a number of years, but uh, this data, will, the GDP data will get revised, uh, gets revised quite substantively over the years. And historically, we've had declines in GDP quarter to quarter that got revised away uh, in subsequent data. And I think that'll happen here because if you look at other data measuring the same thing as GDP, gross domestic income, and I won't go explaining that unless you're interested, it shows positive growth and actually much stronger growth since the pandemic hit two years ago. And I suspect that's probably a better window on you know how things are going. But having said all of that, we're not in recession, uh, but recession risks are awfully high. Uh, you, you know, the economy is slowing, inflation is very high, uh, 9% plus on consumer price inflation. The Fed is on high alert, appropriately so, raising interest rates very rapidly uh, to try to make sure that you know, inflation comes down. Um, and uh, they'll succeed, you know, one way or the other. Either the economy will come down. I've got all kinds of phones. Sorry about that. So <laughs> phones here. Hopefully, hopefully it's not my wife trying to track me down because if that's the case, we're in big trouble. She's got every device is going to go off, you know, here in a minute. But, uh, but uh, uh, the recession risks are, 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 you know, awfully high in that environment. Um, and I'd say I'd put the, uh, this become a bit of a uh, parlor game to, put a probability on recession, but it's a nice way to kind of summarize your people's levels of, you know, angst. I'd say mm-hmm. recession probabilities over the next 12 to 18 months are pretty close to even. And, you know, we need a little bit of luck here uh, on the pandemic because the pandemic is still creating havoc in China and disrupting supply chains and labor markets and adding to uh, pricing pressures. And uh, moreover, uh, uh, we need a little bit of luck on uh, the Russian war in Ukraine, which was highly disruptive, caused oil prices to go skyward. Hopefully, the worst of the fallout on the economy from that invasion is behind us. Uh, and that's where the luck comes in. Hopefully, that's the case. I don't think the war is going to end any anytime in you know, for the foreseeable future, but hopefully the worst of the fallout is behind us. If that's the case, then I think we can navigate through without an economic downturn. But if you know anything goes off the rails there, even a little bit, or you know, those are the known unknowns. Mm-hmm. You know, there's the unknown unknowns. You know, I have this nightmare. You know, to give you a sense of it, of a Cat Five hurricane blowing through the Gulf of Mexico, hitting the Texas coast, taking out a refinery because there's no refining capacity. Gas prices go skyward again, over five dollars a gallon, which was the record we hit back in June. And now yeah. even that simple, you know, that not simple, but you know, that, that, th- that one thing, because sentiment is so bad, you know, people are so nervous that that could push us into recession. So I'd say mm-hmm. we're, we're, we're not, we, we definitely are not in recession. We did not experience recession in the second half of the year, but, you know, clearly conditions are uh, eroding. The economy is weak. We're very vulnerable. Recession risks at this point are uh, uncomfortably high. Okay. So we're, we're teetering. It sounds like uh, you know we, we need kind of every, everything to go right. Uh, what about inflation? What's uh, how worried should be should how worried should we be about that raising higher? Worried, uh, you know. But my you know, uh, as you if you parse my words, uh, you know, uh, close to even odds. So that would say I mm-hmm. still think we navigate through without an outright recession. It's going to be tricky, uncomfortable, but we will navigate through. That is predicated on the. Uh, view that inflation has peaked, that uh, June was the high point. That's when gas hit $5 a gallon you know, nationwide, a record high. Gas prices have come way in since then, and they're going to continue to fall. Uh, and the, you know, the worst of the, of the disruptions to uh, supply chains and labor markets from the pandemic you know, they, that seems to be behind us. You know, things seem to be ironing themselves out, even though China is still being disrupted by the pandemic, given it's no COVID policy and it's lockdowns and that I mean more disruptions coming, but we're navigating through. Uh, also, the good news on inflation is uh, the Fed has succeeded because it has gone on high alert and raised interest rates is going to raise rates again uh, aggressively on Wednesday. 
when they when the FOMC meets, uh, and they're signaling more rate hikes. So by so doing, they have succeeded in bringing inflation expectations back in. And my favorite way of measuring expectations is the bond market, uh, because that's people putting their money where their mouth is. And I think that they're much better read on actual expectations. And they, they, they spiked after Russia invaded and oil prices went higher. That's why the Fed went on high alert. But the Fed has succeeded in bringing them back down. And that's really important to future inflation because you know, everyone thinks inflation is going to be high. It will be high. You know, workers will demand a higher wage to pay for their higher commute costs and businesses say, no problem. I'll give you that higher wage because I can pass that cost in the form of a higher price to my customer because uh, I, I know inflation is going to be high. Everyone, everyone knows we're getting to this kind of self-reinforcing negative cycle, a wage price by a cycle. But that fortunately, the Fed is, has uh, nailed inflation expectations back down where they need to be. So my sense is that inflation will moderate and will, again, that'll be key to navigating through. And just to give you a number to make it more concrete, CPI inflation is just a notch over 9% year over year. By the end of this year, I expect it to be about 6% year over year. By the end of next year, probably somewhere three, three and a half percent ish. And by spring of 24, we'll be back close to the Fed's target, you know, on CPI, the high end is about two and a half percent. So we, you know, we need a good 18 months to get back to inflation that, you know, I think the Fed would, and everyone would feel comfortable with. Okay. Um, let me turn it to Lucy now, because inflation has played quite the role in state budgets, both on the revenue and, and expenditure side. So um, Lucy, can you tell us how do state revenues look this year? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, it's really important to remember that state revenues have declined significantly in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and uh, many states have seen uh, uh, shortfalls in fiscal year 2020. And uh, fast forward, we see strong growth in revenues, both in fiscal year 2021 as well as in fiscal year 2022, which just ended in at the end of June in 46 states. And earlier this year uh, in February, I wrote a blog post saying that the strong growth in uh, state revenues uh, are likely to cool down. And I gave five main reasons. And those reasons being that inflation was driving the growth in revenues, um, um, that the robust stock market was not uh, sustainable, that uh, mm -hmm. the IPO bonanza was going to come to an end, and that many corporations and uh, individual high-income taxpayers might have um, accelerated their income into tax year 2021 in anticipation of higher federal tax rates on corporations and capital gains. Now, inflation was growing prior to the global geopolitical tensions, like at the end of 2021, the inflation was around 4.7%, uh, which was already a 30 year high. Um, and inflation led to stronger growth in both income tax revenues and sales tax revenues. And this is particularly the case in the states where they have progressive income tax structures, but they do not adjust the brackets to uh, inflation. And we have uh, seen the bracket creep. As far as the sales tax revenues, the prices have gone up. And of course, people were uh, paying higher share of the sales tax um, for the uh, cost of the uh, goods that they were uh, spending. And also the pandemic had temporarily shifted spending more on goods rather than on services. And we know that this is also supposed to be temporary. Um, so overall, uh, revenue forecasters were having a hard time to forecast revenues precisely. And unlike in the Great Recession, when forecasters were constantly downgrading their revenue forecasts, in here, this time around, we were seeing revenue forecasters constantly um, underestimating the revenues um, instead of overestimating just like they did in the Great Recession. But uh, 
the current forecasts for the fiscal year 2023 are showing flat growth in nominal terms in revenues, particularly for income tax and corporate income tax. And honestly, looking at the April and May uh, income tax revenues combined, we already see weakness in revenues. Uh, withholding has been growing in single digits not in double digits in the months of April and May combined, and that is in nominal terms, not in inflation-adjusted terms. And what's more important, the estimated payments for the months of April and May combined increased only 0.3%. So that means that the first estimated payment for tax year 2022 is already very weak. So there are growing warning signs for the states uh, that uh, revenue growth is going to be very weak in the uh, in fiscal year 2023. Um, but just it, to kind of take that like two year lens, um, you know, state revenues were very strong last year, and now they're going to be not. Basically, you, you, you projected uh, the revenue projections are going to be flat next year, but that's flat from something that was very strong. I mean, I guess I understand that that forecasting is super difficult, but I kind of stepping back and thinking about the before times, right? So before COVID and now, um, is it safe to say that state revenues have recovered, but now we're kind of in this stagnant environment again? Yeah, because the um, uh, stock market is already performing poorly, so the income tax revenues from non-wage income will not be as strong as it was in the past year. The stock okay. market increase was, uh, was uh, highest in six decades at around 30% in um, tax year 2021. So uh, that we have already seen um, declines in stock market. So that translates into weaker non-wage income tax revenues. And then um, also don't forget that lots of states have enacted tax cuts which is also going to translate into mm -hmm. um, less income tax revenues, as well as the federal aid is going to expire, which is also going to put extra pressure on uh, state budgets. Okay, thank you. Um, so one quick clarification on the economic conditions. Um, do you, so we talked about it being stagnant in the future. So that's primarily because of the economic conditions that Mark referenced. I think it's combination of economic conditions as well as the federal and state policy decisions as well as consumer behavior. So it's really complicated and complex. It's not just the economic conditions. I mean, um, taxpayers, uh, behave um, in a way that uh, they accelerated the, their um, income because they were expecting policy changes and then inflation impacted the revenue. So it, it's a combination of things, not just mm -hmm. one thing. Okay, yeah, of course, it's never simple. Um, <laughs> I wanna turn it over to Shelby because uh, let's talk about spending. Um, again, inflation obviously playing a role here, but Shelby, what are states spending money on this year and how does that differ, how does that differ from what we've seen in the past couple of years? Uh, thanks, Liz. You know, it, it's no surprise that, especially talking about this revenue growth that we're seeing uh, state spending increase. Of course, expenditures have, have gone up. Uh, we released our fiscal survey of the states. Our spring uh, survey covers governor's proposed budgets, so what governors were um, expecting to spend money on. And it's been interesting to see how, just how much the spending has increased. Um, in mm -hmm. fiscal 2022 budget proposals, general fund spending was projected to increase by 13.6% over fiscal 2021 levels. Crazy. And that's the, wow. it's actually the largest um, expenditure increase in 40 years. So um, it sounds wow. big and, you know, that, that word unprecedented, we're tired of hearing, but um, <laughs> you know, it has a, it really is. And that, that growth rate is really driven by a, a number of factors. A lot of it's the one-time surplus funds because states have, as they beat their revenue projections, they have money they didn't intend to spend the year before. They didn't know they were going to have it. So you're seeing 
these spikes in spending sort of lag the revenue growth. Um, there's also a shift in reliance from federal funds in some areas back to general funds. That's going to increase um, general fund spending. And of course, we had some lower baselines due to spending reductions in some states um, during the pandemic uh, when, they, when they were expecting revenues to decrease. Um, and of course, a, another big driver of that are the, the state funding for pandemic response efforts. There's just there's a lot of need both on helping um, helping citizens, helping businesses weather the pandemic, taking care of public health concerns. So there are a lot more demands, I think, on the state spending side that we're seeing. We're seeing a lot more money go into areas that traditionally states have not pumped as much money into. You know, we've seen things in housing assistance and really spike mm -hmm. um, again lots of, pu of public health spending and spending in in economic recovery areas. And so those have been, of course, really large, mm -hmm. really large areas that, um, as you said, have have been different. Um, and looking ahead into fiscal 2023, again we. We see um, an increase. What governors were expecting was about 4.2% um, of expenditure increase. Of course, we're seeing surplus revenues, so that will probably look a little bit different um, in fiscal 2023 as well. And for total state spending, so I have to. I feel like we we concentrate on general funds a lot, but this is a, a completely different environment with so much federal funding going to states and. And total state spending is estimated to have grown 16.2% in fiscal 2021. Um, again, that's the, it's the highest rate in the 35 year history of our state expenditure report, which looks at, at state actual expenditures. Um, and state spending from their own funds, their general funds, and other state funds, um, those were, it was rose 5.7%. Um, but federal funds really are the, the big story there. They increased sharply by 35.7%. And we'll, wow. we'll definitely see that stay high um, with, with the federal funding states have um, and a, large, a lot of large infrastructure projects and things being funded um, by states that, that have not hit expenditures yet. So there's a lot going on on the expenditure side as well and a lot, of, a lot of new things, a lot of things we haven't seen before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so different from after from following the Great Recession when there you know, was very little federal money after that initial boost and, um, and there was such a stagnant recovery. Um, so that's, you know, it's worlds away. I'm, I'm curious, how do you think inflation plays into any of these patterns that we're seeing with government spending? I mean, especially when you think about um, what Mark referenced earlier with employees, you know, demanding higher salaries and, and, and that sort of thing. I mean, are, are, is our payrolls going to need to increase and salaries need to grow? We're seeing salaries increase. You know, there's always that lag. Um, you know, inflation is mm -hmm. hitting, but because of how state appropriations are set almost a year in advance, in some cases, states can't react to it as quickly as, you know, private companies and, and private sector wages. Um, we are, so we are seeing salaries go up, but I think we'll continue to see um, probably some pretty significant increases in, in salaries. Uh, the hiring issues are, of course, very difficult in the public sector. Um, we hear a lot about challenges with education hiring. Um, so I think we'll see, definitely see those start to hit even more as we go forward. Um, we'll also probably see a lot more money go into things like construction costs. You know, the, again, the hard thing with state appropriations is um, you're not, states aren't a, appropriated money to buy X number of things, they're appropriated a dollar amount. So when right. inflation hits and it, and it eats away at your purchasing power, you you do fewer things, you buy fewer things. So, um, you know, if you have construction projects right now, states are scaling back what they can accomplish. Um, but I think we'll see more appropriations go into those areas to make up for it. Um, same thing with, you know, offsetting gas prices, offsetting food prices in, in institutions and schools, things like that. I think we'll see it. It just takes a little bit longer for it to catch up in the state appropriation process. Okay. Yeah. And that is one of, not to say that governments are disadvantaged, but as you mentioned, the private sector can just raise the salary and, and with government salaries, it's not that, not as easy as, as all of that. <laughs> it's definitely not. And it, it really is a hiring disadvantage. I think that's mm -hmm. accurate to say um, it's, it takes so long to react to those salary changes and the, and the competitiveness and with how fast wages have risen in the private sector, states really are at a disadvantage. Yeah. Um, so I want to turn it back to Mark and now, and ask you, Mark, um, 
looking back, if particularly, I, I actually want to get your reaction first to what Shelby just said in terms of the general fund spending and then the overall spending increases, you know, uh, highest in 40 years. Um, what kind of role do you think federal aid played in, the, in, in that and then, you know, where the economy is today? Well, I think key role, uh, you know, that I think if you told up all of the state and local support and Shelby and Lucy may know the numbers better than I, but I think it came to about five in the American Rescue Plan. That was the piece of legislation that passed March of last year, the close to $2 trillion in additional support for the economy. Think about a half trillion of that, 500 billion went to state and local governments. You know, it's 150 billion education, the rest of it right to state and local governments. And, you know, obviously that's helping to support the spending that's occurring right now and will continue mm -hmm. to support the spending going forward on lots of different things. Uh, so I think that was critical. And I think Shelby made a great point, or maybe it was you, Liz, that, you know, very different than the environment that prevailed after the great financial crisis. And you can see the differences, you know, in, you know, how states are, are uh, behaving and performing uh, and co contributing to, you know, broader economic growth. So, you know, very mm -hmm. different kind of environment. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's adding to growth. Interestingly though, you know, if you look at the, going back to the GDP numbers, uh, and the declines uh, in the first quarter, which is hard data, I think state and local government spending actually fell on a real basis. It didn't contribute. And it, you know, it, we, we'll see what happens with Q2 data. But so far, at least all that spending hasn't really shown up in the GDP accounts to a significant degree. I, I, yeah. I suspect it will. It's just you know, a matter of time. Uh, and, and it goes back to my point about measurement issues with regard to the GDP numbers and revisions, that kind of thing but you haven't really seen it show up in the aggregate macroeconomic statistics yet, just yet. But I think, you know, obviously it's been, you know, key to uh, state and local governments continue to help drive the economic train going forward. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, and if you're probably in state and local government, you know, co contrasting what has, the aid that the federal government has, has given out now compared with the great recession, I mean, it's, you know, it's very, very welcome, but then you also have people saying, well, it's too much, it's causing the inflation. So, um, you know, we, we, gave, we gave the state and local governments too much money. So where, where do you, what do you think about the level of money and, 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 how, and how much was spent? Well, I mean, in hindsight, it, it probably was more than was necessary to support the economy. Uh, uh -huh. you know, but, you know, think back to March of 2021, the pandemic was still on. The vaccines had not been rolled out. You know that was yeah. money. It's it's good fiscal policy when there's more uncertainty to provide more support to the economy. Mm -hmm. And we got we got the vaccines rolled out, so we got it. You know the, the pandemic hasn't gone away, but you know things have played out very differently if we had not. I'm sure if we had not gotten that, those vaccines, so it was more of an insurance policy, I think, uh, just in case things went off the rails. And also, you know, I'm sure the political dynamics at the time, you know, uh, argued for trying to front load things because there's only perhaps one bite at that apple. You couldn't get another bite if you needed it. So maybe we do a little bit more than might be necessary. And in fact, if you looked at my projections back then, baseline projections, I, you know, I didn't think you needed that amount of, you know, um, 200, $500 billion to kind of fill the budget hole that, you know, seemed to be uh, being created by the pandemic. Uh, having said that, I don't think that has contributed significantly, as I said, to growth or inflation. That's to that that will play out over time here. It, it, you know, it, it hasn't really been it mm -hmm. hasn't really shown up in a significant way, but it might just in time. You know, if we go into recession, that might be pretty handy to have that extra funds to help kind of navigate yeah. through. If I'm right about inflation coming in, so will revenues. Lucy mentioned the stock market. The next thing that's going is real estate values. And that's you know, going to put a lot of pressure on local government through property taxes. So it may very well be the case. This is you know, much needed help with the, 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 the next you know, uh, set of problems we have with the economy and potential uh, economic recession, all of which in my mind goes back to the pandemic. I mean, that was a, and of course now the Russian invasion, those two things, massive shocks to the economy and you know they're still reverberating and still creating havoc. So that money, that ARP money, you know, may actually end up being quite helpful at some point here in the not too distant future. 
That's a great point. And governments have until I think it's the end of 2024, Shelby, I'm sure you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, uh, to actually spend that, which support, you know, that 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 supports that idea. We we just don't know what's going to happen any, you know, in every six months period from now. Um Lucy and Shelby. It's actually 2026. Um 26, there it is. So yeah, you, thank you. Is the expenditure deadline, which uh, you know, with, with some of these large infrastructure projects, they will be coming online, like Mark said probably right when the economy needs that boost. You know, they, they take a little while to get off the ground. So that'll help with employment and spending going forward as well. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna get your reaction to, to, to what Mark said about um, federal funding and impacting the state budgets. Maybe in retrospect, it was too much, but who knows. Um, what's your perspective on that? Well, you know, it's, it's not just direct money to states. A lot of it, a lot of what we're seeing in the, you know, in these strong revenues were the, it's the federal stimulus that propped up the economy, right? Kept people spending, it kept people employed and paying income taxes and um, kept companies online. So that, that assistance has, has been vital. The federal assistance, um, again, not, not just what went directly to states um, to cover budget holes and help with spending. So I think that's been really important. And, and I think is, is, uh, you know, I know Mark talks a lot about the excess savings that, that consumers had built up and that's really kept things moving along and kept people spending, um, helping people keep their spending up in this time of high inflation. So I, I think it's been key. And, and Lucy, what, what's your, your take on it? Um, I think at the time it was a prudent fiscal policy, but looking back, probably it could have been more targeted. We are seeing that the, some local governments are suffering, particularly those that are being highly impacted by the remote work and the commercial property values going down. Uh, so it, the bottom line is that this pandemic had such an uneven impact on different sectors, on different people and on different um, localities and states. So um, it was difficult to come up with a formula that will fit everyone, but uh, it was a necessary package, but it could have been more targeted. Okay. Um, I, I'm actually gonna, jump to one of the, I'm going off script guys. Um, I'm gonna jump to one of the Q and A's cause it just kind of really, one of the questions submitted um, is about money from the CARES Act and from the American Rescue uh, Plan Act. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and ask this one before we kind of move on to that, to the next little segment here, but it's from Kelsey who asks, are states using too much of the money from CARES and ARPA? and strong revenues to provide economic development incentives or tax cuts. Uh, Lucy, I think you mentioned tax cuts earlier. So do you wanna, do you wanna take this one? Well, if you don't um, mind, Liz, I just wanna, I would sure. like to, to first address the fact that those funds are not being used for, for tax cuts. Um, federal funds could, you know, cannot be used to backfill tax cuts and, and states have, strong revenues of their own that they've used for those reductions. So I just want to jump in with that and make sure that that um, is clear to everyone. Thank you. And also to add to that, the tax cuts are <laughs> popular during the election years and we are in a midterm election year. So it was and particularly that uh, the revenues were growing and growing by double digits. So the tax cuts would have happened despite the ARPA money and the federal aid. Um, but fast forward, um, these tax cuts will have a negative impact on the budget for sure in the coming years. And uh, this was the time for the state to uh, think of uh, more uh, long-term fiscal planning rather than doing a tax cut. And um, uh, there are lots of challenges ahead of us and the aging population is one of them. Um, so the bottom line is that no matter what the tax cuts would have happened because that's just part of the political gimmicks. <laughs> well put. <laughs> Um, okay, now let's uh, let's dig into the stock market because uh, I, I have questions for all of you on that. But uh, let's 
kick it back to Mark first. Um, do we think the current declines uh, declines are temporary, or are we going to see lower levels throughout this year? Oh, that's a tough one, huh? You want personal investment <laughs> advice? Uh, exactly. Just pull out your crystal ball, please. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I have I have many crystal balls. That that takes a special <laughs> one, though. Uh, well, my sense is that. Uh, the worst is over for the stock market, the equity market, if the economy avoids a recession. So that, you know, we're down, it depends on the day, say 20% from the all-time peak. By, by the way, interestingly enough, the all-time peak in the stock market was the first trading day of this year, you know, 2022, January 3rd, I think, 2022. And we're down about 20%. So that's a, what uh, folks in the, uh, in the market call a bear market. So we're in a bear market. And I think that is consistent with, you know, uh, the higher interest rates. That is consistent in where the Fed is going to put rates over the next few months. It is consistent with a weaker economy, but it's not consistent with a recessionary economy, I don't think. So if, if I'm right, as I said, just somewhat better than even odds that we go in recession. So we, we, we skate by very close, but we skate by. Then I think more or less... Uh, this is uh, the worst of it. Uh, you know, I don't expect the market to come back at all quickly because uh, as long as the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates, I just don't see investors, you know, piling in in any meaningful way. There'll be good days and there'll be bad days and they'll go up and down and all around, but I don't really see it going anywhere until the Fed is very clearly finished and we're very clearly on the other side of the recession risk. So that probably won't be until sometime, you know, next year, you know, into next year. So I ba basically we go flat. However, you know, uh, a lot of risk around that. Uh, I do think, uh, and they're skewed to the downside. If we do go into recession, and if you look historically, the equity market tends to fall. Uh, I think the kind of the median decline is about twenty five percent. Peak to trough, you know, in recession, mm -hmm. and the I think the average is closer to thirty. So I suspect we have another leg down in stock prices, uh, and that'll you know uh, we haven't seen the bottom. So a lot depends on whether the the economy actually goes into recession or not. I, the other thing I'd say though, and and this probably is kind of more important, and I have more confidence in than predicting where the stock market is going to be in the next six to twelve months, is that I wouldn't count on if I were a state budgeter, I wouldn't count on the kind of stock returns going forward that we've gotten historically. So if you, you look historically, it's been incredible gains. You know, even with this decline, stock prices are up 10% per annum over the last 10 years. I think they're pretty close to that over the last 25. And that, that largely goes to the steady decline in interest rates throughout that time. You know, the peak was back in the 70s and 80s. The bottom was right before the, right during the pandemic. And that's a tailwind to stock prices, right? It, 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 lower rates means higher price earnings multiples, PE multiples, valuation across all asset markets, by the way. Housing values reflect this as well. Uh, but, you know, that drove up stock returns. But I think it's pretty fair to say that's over. Uh, that, you know, r rates are not going any lower than they were back a year ago, you know, when 10 year yields were below 3%. And if anything, they feel like they, on a trend basis, going to move higher. So that headwind, that tailwind goes to, at best to being neutral and perhaps a bit of a headwind. So, you know, instead of 10% per annum, I'd be expecting kind of mid single digit return, like say 5% ish. So if I were a budgeter and I had to put something in my spreadsheet or my model, I'd probably factor in a 5% return over the next five, 10 years, you know, something like that. Very different than what we got in the previous 10, 25 years. Yeah, yeah. And uh, most pension funds uh, bank on a little bit more than that per year. I think it's seven. Um, is so seven? Is it about seven? I think seven's about the average. Seven I'm sure about Shelby the average, yeah. Right. Shelby, you can tell us that when you, <laughs> when I, um, in this next response. But I mean, first of all, the spot stock market over the last couple of years, I think, has given everybody whiplash. Um, but, but for pension funds in particular, it was a lot of concern that they were gonna lose money and then they all did great. Then they had this amazing year and now we're hearing this, you know, now we have what's happening lately. So, um, and early indications are that with this latest round of volatility, it's gonna translate into losses for, for pension funds. So Shelby, what does, 
that mean for state budgets, uh, you know, go, looking ahead? We, we have seen, um, you know, some of that concern and, and it's always tough when the stock market goes down. And especially after these last gains, I think states have been feeling very good about the state of their pension funds. Um, the other thing we've seen are states using their surplus funds to transfer um, to transfer some of that general fund into their pension funds and shore things up and put things in a little bit better position. And with these losses, I think we might see a little bit more of that, you know, where states have have the one-time surplus, they there's only, you know, it's hard to spend that much money in a one-time manner. Um, mm -hmm. So shoring up pension funds is a good, a good use of those funds and a good, you know, good way to help things going forward. Um, but it's definitely a concern. We, we do see that there's going to be some losses and and that you know, what, what that'll um, translate into is, is states having to pay more to, to make upset the, uh, offset those losses on the stock market. Okay. Uh, Lucy, anything to, to add to that? Um, sure. So about three quarters of state pension fund investments are allocated to risky high fee assets, which must be scrutinized. And we know that um, a fund administrator should regularly review and adjust their assumed rates of return. And the good news is that actually between 2014 and 2019, about 46 states have lowered their assumed rates of uh, return. So, um, and a recent trend among large pension plans has been that uh, to divest from hedge funds, for example, uh, the largest uh, pension plans like in California or New York City announced um, intentions to exit the asset class because of high fees and poor performance. So to adjust the expectations is, uh, is a good uh, policy. Okay. Um, let's, uh, I'll, before I open it up to the Q&A from the audience in terms of those questions, and we've gotten quite a few, so thank you uh, to everyone who submitted questions. Um, I just want to kind of do a quick round robin and ask the three of you uh, to, for everyone to pull out their crystal balls now and, and tell us where do you think, what are things going to look like, you know, five years from now? And so this would be you know, and mid mid 2027, when all of that American Rescue Plan funding is spent, maybe all the IIJ projects are are, are up and going or completed. Um, do we have and and Mark, I'll start with you. Um, do you have any predictions? Well, Liz, I mean, it's five years from now. Uh, you know, I'm I'm generally optimistic. I mean, uh, about the economy. I mean, I think that would be our historical experience don't bet against the American economy. I mean, we are very innovative. Uh, we adapt uh, to challenges and we ultimately prevail. Uh, you know, our economy is incredibly dynamic. You can actually see it, feel it. I mean, if you look at business formation in the last, uh, really since the pandemic hit, it's been very strong. I mean, we know this from uh, taxpayer identification numbers. If you start a company, you need a uh, EIN number. And so we can see EIN numbers and it's across lots of industries all over the country. And that goes to the dynamism of, you know, our economy. So I think uh, I would generally be optimistic about our prospects. H having said that, obviously we have some very significant challenges. Uh, you know, right now we're dealing with the pandemic and uh, the fallout from the Russian invasion, but we've got many long-term challenges that, you know, policymakers are having a hard time addressing. Uh, you know, uh, I think in the next five years, the thing that's going to be kind of top of mind is going to be housing. Uh, we have a very severe shortage of affordable housing, which, by the way, adds significantly to inflation through higher rent growth. And, uh, you know, that was part of the Build Back Better agenda, tax uh, credits and additional spending to try to improve the supply of affordable housing more quickly. But, you know, we can't get, that can't get, that's not getting through. Uh, Childcare, uh, healthcare. Uh, and of course, the thing that, this isn't gonna be a game changer in the next five years, but it's definitely a, a major challenge is climate change. And, you know, there's very strong evidence that 
the greater the upfront investments you make to reduce emission, the benefits of that long run are enormous. And the longer you wait, the more co costly this is going to become uh, by orders of magnitude. So we've got our challenges. But I'll, I guess I'll end by saying I'll use a Winston Churchill quip. Uh, and I'll, I'm sure I'm going to butcher this, but you'll get the gist of it. Americans try everything and then they do the right thing. And that I think works, you know, based on my experience. That's pretty, pretty optimistic. Uh, Shelby, do you have anything to add to that? Those are some pretty, pretty major challenges. Childcare, healthcare, affordable housing, climate change uh, from the state spending perspective. Uh, well, do, what do we have to add to that? <laughs> I, I like that um, Mark has an optimistic view of the economy. I'd like to hear that. But on the, <laughs> you know, on the budget officer side, I think uh, the mantra is always, you know, expect the best, but prepare for the worst. You know, nobody wants to, <laughs> nobody wants to be cutting budgets and, and dealing with downturns. Um, but they're, you know, they're inevitable. And I think everybody recognizes that these strong, just, um, you know, record levels of, of revenues are not, not it's not going to last. Um, so, you know, I think when we look ahead five years, things will certainly even out, um, you know, we'll, we'll see some, some decreases in those gains, but um, states are, are better prepared to weather the next five years than I think they've ever been prepared to weather a, a downturn, um, you know, in history. We've got rainy day fund levels are, are you know, at, at record highs, um, and I think we'll see those continue to go up, as we've seen. That's a, a lot of what states do with their their strong revenues and these unanticipated funds is they they save them. Um, they've also been putting themselves in strong financial positions by paying off debt and, um, like I said, shoring up those pension funds and putting money in their unemployment trust funds. So I think they're really well prepared, and we'll see that we'll see them weather whatever happens in the next five years um, pretty pretty well. You know, and and, and as Mark said, though they'll have those federal funds during that period and. And probably be you know helping the economy with infrastructure projects and and spending with those as well. So, I, I am also pretty optimistic about the next five year window. Hey Liz, I, I don't know about you, but that sounded really optimistic to me. It sure yeah. did. Yeah, for a budget <laughs> officer, what I mean, I know, I know, I, I, That's a good point. That's the it goes against the you know typical your DNA. Officer, your DNA you just like, violated your we've, DNA. We've, yeah, it, it, we're uh, everybody's been watching for that, that rainy day right so yeah. very well prepared yeah but you're i mean yeah rainy day funds are, are replenished and and higher than they were pre right before covid hit so you know optimistic with good reason lucy are you going to bring us down or <laughs> how are you feeling about the next five years i am afraid to say that unlike <laughs> mark and shelby <laughs> I am really pessimistic, <laughs> and I think states will continue to face fiscal challenges, and particularly next five years are critical because there are so many things changing. We have the federal aid uh, money running out. We have some of the provisions of tax cuts and job tax um, expiring. So there will be shifting policies, and uh, you know. I think that we will still think, be talking about structural imbalances. Uh, five years down the road, we are still going to have uh, continue seeing a large volatility in state tax revenues. And um, there are things that states also have to think about, like the increased remote work, how do you tax it, the increased shared economy the increase of employment. So these are all challenges for states that they have to think about. And of course, um, they also have to think about how to fund um, um, natural disasters caused by the climate change. Mm -hmm. And we see growth of it year over year. Well, and I think, I, you know, so I think just to add to that, I think that's <laughs> true that there, all those challenges exist and, and that's what we're seeing states talk about and think about and plan for. So, um, but there's there's no shortage of, of you know, challenges on the horizon for sure. Yeah, um, I, I want to turn it to the Q&A now um, and ask about one of the, uh, you know, one of the challenges that, that kind of we spoke of briefly and 
Uh, Zach Schiller submitted a question about government staffing levels. Um, and, and the question is, how do you explain the weaknesses in state and local employment given the spending levels? And is that going to change soon? Shelby, do you want to take this one? There are a lot of, uh, a lot of reasons for that that I, I hear talked about. But I think a big one is the, is the hiring challenges that states and local governments are facing. Um, so we talked about it's harder for them to react to rising wages. So that makes it harder for them to, to fill positions and to be competitive in this market. And so if I, if I had to pick one reason, I think that's the, the biggest reason why um, employment just hasn't come back. Anyone else want to have anything to, to add into that? OK. Um, <clears throat> there, we've got a question for Lucy um, on income tax receipts and growth reduction. Um, Chris Portwright asks, is it possible that any income tax receipts uh, uh, growth reductions are attributed to the stock market struggles and that those won't show up until FY24? Um, spring filing season of, of, of uh, the year 2024. Um, in other words, have, have there been enough long-term capital gains that have built up in the recent years that the sell-off this year will still involve claiming a great deal of capital gains? Do you want me to rephrase that or? <laughs> um, I tried to answer in writing, but uh, for sure the stock market has already, the, the, the weakness in stock market already shown up in estimated payments for mm -hmm. tax year 2022, which were due in April 15. And we have seen only 0.3% growth in estimated payments for the April and May months combined. And we do combined months because last year income tax due date was deferred to May. So it's better to look forward to months together. Um, as far as the capital gains realizations, I think actually a lot of uh, corporations and high income taxpayers might have accelerated realizations to uh, tax year 2021 in anticipation of higher tax rates um, on um, capital gains as promised by the Biden administration. Of course, it didn't happen and both proposals seem to be dead by now. But still, you know, whenever there are talks and proposals, uh, taxpayers act upon it. And so it's hard to say what would uh, taxpayers do, but I think both realizations have been already accelerated to tax year 2021. Well, thanks, Lucy. Um... I'm going to turn now to, to tax cuts and, and uh, you know, incentive packages. I'm going to try and combine some. We've had a few questions about uh, from the Q&A about tax cuts in states. And um, the, the, the general theme is it said in the federal uh, funding that states were not allowed to use federal funds to, to pay for a tax cut. So that's one end of it. And then on the other hand, you see you know, people see headlines about states offering this company an incentive for, uh, you know, electric vehicle production or cutting, you know, a lot of places cutting taxes, as Lucy mentioned, it's an election year. So uh, maybe uh, Shelby, can you explain to us why one isn't related to the other? How does, how do the rules allow for take states to still, still cut taxes? Well, I think if you, you know, set aside the um, court cases that have been working their way through on that provision and just look at what Treasury put out in terms of guidance about that provision. Um, it talked about the fact that states can cut taxes with their own funds. They just couldn't backfill those with federal funds. And as Lucy did a great job of describing, um, you know, state revenues have been growing at really high rates. So what we're seeing are states implementing tax reductions with their own funds. And that was um, something that, that Secretary Yellen very quickly came out and, and uh, you know, reassured people that um, there, it wasn't a blanket prohibition on tax cuts. So that's, that's the difference there is, is the, the source of funding um, to pay for the cuts. Okay. Um, I have sort of a follow-up on that from Mark or for Mark and, or, or 
you know, in the group, but I mean, should we be worried given, given everything we've talked about? I mean, I know we're all as optimistic about the next five years, but there's a lot of uncertainty. Should we be worried about states cutting taxes uh, right now? Mark, do you want to start off and then I'll, I'll kick it out to the rest of you? Well, uh, I think as Shelby pointed out, you know, rainy day funds are ample. Their record levels, revenues are strong. Um, you know, the, the most likely forecast scenario that I'm sure budgeters are using is one that has slowing growth, but an economy that avoids an economic downturn. Uh, you know, prudent uh, budgeter would forecast flat stock prices from here, some house price declines, uh, CRE, uh, commercial real estate price declines. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, it also rising costs, labor costs for sure, because you need to staff up and fill those unfilled positions. But if you kind of do the arithmetic in the in the um, in the in the budgeting, I think some states certainly could come to the conclusion that they could, and, and then it becomes a choice. You know, what do I do with the extra funds that I have? Do I cut taxes or do I increase government programs? Um, and that's a, that's a political choice that's you know made I think appropriately by each state based on their you know their own perspective on things, and and so yeah I think tax cuts are are I'm, I'm sure are reasonable for some states and and you know uh, I I don't have I don't have a strong view whether states are overdoing it or you know uh, being overly aggressive, but I don't think you know. Uh, prima facie that uh, tax cuts are, should be ruled out. I mean, I think that's, that's just another tool that state governments can use. The only thing I say is, <clears throat> I do think, uh, you know, many states uh, are in a very, we're in a very competitive world, right? And states are looking to attract businesses uh, to come to their state. And, you know, for some states, I don't think that makes a whole lot of sense, uh, you know, for well-developed economies, I don't, I wouldn't think that would be an appropriate thing to do generally, but for some states that are, you know, have thin economies, don't have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, they're not deep economies, that kind of strategy probably is important and effective in trying to help improve their long-term economic growth. So, um, you know, I think, those kinds of incentives are there they belong in the toolkit you know whether they should be used or not i think that's a matter of judgment and depends on the state and kind of their perspective on things but i i think it is something that should be in the toolkit both tax cuts and you know the use of tax incentives for economic development okay. lucy shelby agree disagree um Unfortunately, what we have seen is that in a lot of cases, those tax cuts are uh, targeted to benefit higher income taxpayers. So I agree that tax cuts should be an option. However, I think given the uneven impact of the pandemic on lower income uh, taxpayers, they should have been targeted to benefit low income taxpayers rather than high income taxpayers. All right, thanks. And we are just about out of time for Shelby. I'll give you the last word on this one before we wrap it up. <laughs> uh, so I, I think also we need to recognize that states have been implementing these tax reductions in ways that do show they're being cautious. You know, they're, they're doing um, one-time rebates, they're using revenue triggers, they're staggering their implementation. Uh, and also a lot of the, the states that have implemented tax cuts are high growth states. So I think we're seeing um, more, we're seeing sustainable growth in those states and that pressure that, that Mark mentioned about attracting companies in this new remote environment, you're also trying to attract new citizens who wanna come and, and add to your economy. So I think there are a lot of things going on and, and the long-term revenue and expenditure modeling states have done that I have seen um, has, has really made me uh, not, not be as concerned about it. I, I think there's um, that states really have been doing this in a very judicious and cautious manner. Yeah, well, 
I want to thank all three of you again um, for for your time today. Your really insightful comments and uh, slightly spirited debate and optimism and and Lucy's dose of pessimism, <laughs> or maybe we'll call it reality. Um, again, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Thank you for all the questions and answers, and thank you to the Urban Institute for letting me moderate this event. Have a good afternoon, everyone. <laughs>